Welcome to China X Office Hours Week 13. It's ex quite extraordinary. We've already gone through 13 weeks. I'm here with Graham Chamnis, who's a graduate student here at Harvard, one of uh, somebody working on poetry, in fact, and, and, and the literature of, of the medieval period. And uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank a couple people. Tasmanian Tiger, you've been helping others, clarifying uh, some, some issues for them. And Tong X, you've been translating English poems composed by students in the Chinese, which is great. I think there's general agreement that, that the poetry module uh, gave you a chance to do more difficult things than you had done before in many instances, but also to opportunities to compose a poem. You enjoyed meeting Professor Owen and uh, like sort of the step-by-step -step introduction of poetry. But we had some questions. Yeah, we did. The first question is, did everyone write poetry or only court poets or the wealthy? I think it's really actually a difficult question to answer. It's quite clear that, that the court in the medieval period and in the Tang is the center of culture. And so you would expect to have all these things that are regarded as marks of culture, like the ability to compose literary works, whether in prose or poetry, be taking place at court. But it's also true that over time that uh, poetry became a mark of being an educated person. And that included many people outside of the court, but I don't think it, it really was limited, of course, to people who could read and write, which probably didn't exceed more than 10% of the population ever. But men and women, and particularly eventually uh, educated women, uh, are certainly composed poetry a great deal. Uh, question for you, uh, how did the culture of poetry develop? Um, well, I think it's important to remember that in our module we're dealing with uh, poems in five character or seven character lines. Um, and this was, this is usually seen as uh, part of the golden age of Chinese poetry in the Tang Dynasty, but those forms of poetry existed throughout the medieval period and other forms like uh, four character line poetry, um, other long rhyming rhapsodies. Um, and later on we have developments like Tsi, uh, in the Song Dynasty, um, and none of these forms ever die out completely. Um, they're always expanded on and growing, and even today in China you'll find all these different genres of poetry still being composed. So in China today you also have sort of what's sometimes called modern poetry, which isn't so regulated. Um, right. But there are still people who compose classical poetry and classical lyrics, the Tzu lyric for example. There are still people who even compose the Han Fu, which is a very old form. Mm -hmm. And I think some of this is on the web, so you can actually yeah, you uh, can you can, you can join poetry clubs on the web. Mm -hmm. There were some other questions you asked. Um, how does poetry evolve as we go forward? A some people ask, could we discuss something about translation? Uh, what was the relationship to music? Is Du Fu writing uh, on the spot for singers? Is he writing music as well? We're not going to answer those questions, not because we don't have ideas about them, um, but because, in fact, you've convinced us that it's going to make a lot of sense for futures China X uh, modules to develop more modules on poetry. And so that's what we'll do in the coming years. Thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, short response question. Uh, so we, we gave a couplet. Uh, raising my head to watch the moon, laying it down, thoughts of home arise. Chu to Wang Ming Yue, Di to Si Gu Xiang. This is from Li Bai, another Tang poet. And so you ask people to say something about that. Well, we wanted you to start the module by learning to notice things in a poem and not just reading it quickly. So we wanted you to slow down. And we were happy with our responses because we found um, roughly two modes of uh, noticing what's going on here. And the first one you could describe as um, either content-based or interpretive. And uh, we could mention uh, Ellsworth and Ellen Fu, uh, who've noted um, the, uh, the poet here who's longing, who's lonely. Um, but the other important aspect to remember, um, for example, we uh, had responses from Susan Riggs and Caroline P.H is structurally what what we see here is, as you now well know from watching the module, um, parallelism between lines within the couplet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and actually that's one of the things that we want you always to keep in mind in, in reading Chinese writing, even into the present, mm -hmm. that the, the extraordinary importance of parallelism 
And I wonder, you know, in part that's because of the nature of the written language, where you have a lot of single character words, uh, and you don't have, and traditionally you don't have punctuation, um, and very often the subject is left off and the object, but that parallelism really helps you find your way when you're reading Chinese. Right? Yeah, it does. And it gets very complicated. We could talk about the organization of Chinese encyclopedia, et cetera. But. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we had a, um, a second question, which is uh, sort of identifying which the parallel couplets were, and you, we have some examples of that. Uh, there's another question, um, which is the whole issue of the progression of couplets. And, and this was taking a uh, guest comes and asking that. I was, I was uh, really impressed by that. But I'll give you some examples. Edgewood, 1852, makes this, a, sees a temporal progression. So um, they're moving from past to present to the future in that poem. Uh, Sylvia 26 MC sees space. And I think that she picks up on, on, the, on the sense of the almost the cinematic quality, how a poem begins with this wide spatial range, and then zooms in, becomes narrower and narrower. Actually, both of these things, the spatial change over a course of a poem and the uh, temporal change, the temporal focus or the spatial focus, this th always good things to keep in mind. Um, Certainly. And then, uh, Marie de Clich. Yeah, I like this one. You like this one? You should like it. It's, it is... Well, it's very classical. It, yeah. The, the, um, That's why he likes it. It's so classical. The progress of qi cheng zhuan he. Um, what does that mean? To begin in the first couplet, cheng mm -hmm. to continue in the second couplet, um, then zhuan, a turn, an unexpected mm -hmm. turn, and he, a conclusion that wraps it together. Closing, yeah. Okay. Um, now, we gave another Dufu poem called Moonlit Night, uh, Yue Ye, uh, in which Dufu is there in, in the moonlit, the moon tonight in Fuzhou, he begins, she watches alone in her chamber. While far away, I think, lovingly on daughters and sons. Well, you can see the poem right before you. What themes do you see being developed here? Well, my favorite thing to notice in this involves uh, the poetic speaker and also where we are in the poem. It opens with this um, scene, and I think there are lovers here, and they're tied together by the moon. Uh, you can gaze at the moon in different parts of the world. Um, mm. Uh, and although you're separated, the moon is something that's holding you together. And then the second couplet, we have uh, the poet who is longing for his loved one and his sons and daughters um, from far away. But then in the third couplet, it transitions back to a scene of, um, of his lover present there. In scented fog, her cloud-like hairdo moist, its clear beams, her jade white arms are cold. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in the last line, we we see these two uh, united together in conclusion. But this is his wife, right? This is his wife. It's actually, the, uh, when we were speaking before this, I noticed for the first time, it seems, although he says he's thinking lovingly on daughters and sons, in the poem, if, if you read the whole poem, it doesn't really seem like he's thinking about his daughters and sons very much which at all. He's thinking about his wife. Yes, which is why I, what I said to Graham, was I said, this is an erotic poem. I mean, how often do you talk about your wife's moist hairdo, the jade-like purity of her arms in public? And it strikes me that that actually is something really quite extraordinary about the poem, is that Du Fu has taken some of the most intimate things of his life and feeling and made them public. Uh, and that's really quite an extraordinary move. Du Fu is a great poet in many ways, I mean, he, in part because he does things that are unexpected, and yet he does them with a highly regulated form. We then turn to uh, something that was quite optional for everybody, but creating your own poems. And we had some wonderful responses. We began with sort of fill in the blanks of the, uh, the, the two lines. Uh, A, path has never been B, C, gate, for the first time, D. And we invited people to fill that out. And, and we actually have um, numerical responses about who, how many people did what. 
It seems like people preferred the secluded path, the narrow path, Yo uh, Jing, Xia Jing. They preferred tread illuminated Jian or Zhao, right. etc. Um, and the mysterious gate for the first time opens. We also asked people to create a parallel couplet uh, by filling in the blanks with their own words, not just choosing. So it's sort of a step up in difficulty here. And we actually got ones. Uh, Monty Burns had, had a cool one. Monty Burns, who seems to have loved this uh, module, and especially the assessments, writes, the course has never been more enigmatic. The assessments... <laughs> what he's trying to say, <laughs> what he's trying to say is Monty Burns says, the course has never been more enigmatic. The assessments now, for the first time, fail. So thank you, Monty. I designed those assessments. <laughs> yeah, that's why he's laughing. Your feedback. Um, so we're, there are so many cool ones. Uh, we're not going to, to go through them all. Gorgon 45, the snow has never stopped. The back now for the first time cracks. Let me tell you, in Massachusetts, we've had snow week after week when, before we're doing this. And uh, there are points I've thought my back was about to crack. So I made my wife do the snow shoveling. Um, I helped her a little bit. Yes. Our son helped her. Uh, I don't know. We have so many here. I don't think we can do them all. We also had a third task, which is to try creating a couplet that follows uh, the semantic parallelism. We had one from Roger James. The hot ardor of youth burns the heart. The warm companionship of age comforts the soul. And we can definitely see the parallelism used nicely there. And yeah. again, the idea here was to build up from a simple model where you selected from a Dropbox, and then now people are composing their Yeah, own. that's great. And he has the hot ardor of youth. I'm interested in the warm companionship of old age. Well, that'll come someday. Yeah. Um, Erasmus and A, uh, a nice, oh, again, the young and old contrast. A baby for the first time says a word. The old man, for the last time, writes a poem. Well, we hope it's not for the last time. We had one from, from Lai Ha. Tang Shi Gu Lai Ren Zhuan Song. The Tong poems have been read and recited from the ancient until now. We, as students learning, our hearts grow fonder. That's nice. That's nice. We have more in Chinese and in English. And the final task was to compose a full poem. And we had a wonderful poem from P.S. Uh, Dim Sum. Gorgon 45, Bry Brewster, and mm. Bentley, P.C. Chong. Uh, P.C. Chong actually gave two. I was struck by these because the first one might be called almost nationalistic. Mm. You know, the, the rise of China and its empires fall from glory, yet China always recovers. And the great promise of Kada Xinming, Ping Tian Sha, getting a new mandate and brings peace mm. to all under heaven. But then he writes a, the counter, counterpoint to that in That's some right. ways. Coming to America. Coming to America. And in search of freedom and democracy. And America coming to the rescue of, of Europe. Uh, and I, I, I actually think that, that he, he adopts two voices. And those two voices actually uh, two different points of view, a Chinese point of view, a point of view from the United States, both sort of buying into some of the, the desires of the people in these countries. I think it was very, very, very nicely done. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about calligraphy. And we have Professor Bai, who's coming in to do a demonstration. We have uh, Ren Wei, who's going to talk about the legend of Wang Shijir, the first great piece of calligraphy in China. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we'll see you there. Thanks. Thank you.